Hi. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Welcome back from lunch. Um, so we're going to continue our program now. And um, uh, I'm very happy to uh, introduce Dr. Drew Coleman, who is a uh, a uh, psychologist and a neuropsychologist uh, who has been working in our program for the last year. We're so happy uh, that he has been doing that. And he actually has sort of joint expertise in, in psychosis and, and autism and sort of following along this theme of, you know, uh, symptom-based care. Um, he's going to be talking about some of the symptoms that those disorders have in common and some kind of focused treatment and sort of along the lines of social cognition and that kind of thing that we've been talking about. But this time, now we're going to talk about this in people with um, ongoing illness, um, and not necessarily in the earliest stages. Um, so with that, I welcome uh, Dr. Komen to the podium. Thank you, Dr. Holden. Thanks for everyone kind of sticking around and joining us today. I appreciate it. It's been nice to see familiar faces and, and meet new people as well. So, um, so I'm one of the clinical psychologists and uh, in-house, I guess, neuropsychologists in the first episode program. And as Dr. Holt mentioned, I, I kind of hail from the autism world, uh, where I started there really interested in the individual differences that we see in autism spectrum disorders, um, and really kind of figuring or understanding further um, why it is a spectrum, right? And then in addition to that, kind of from a clinical standpoint, really trying to tailor evidence-based treatments that we already know are effective for other conditions and, and trying to tailor and mold those into um, treatments that would be effective for individuals impacted by autism as those treatments don't oftentimes fit. And that's really grown into an interest or grew into an interest of really kind of the, uh, the comorbidity that we see um, in uh, autism spectrum disorders, including uh, co-occurring conditions uh, such as schizophrenia, and, and also understanding uh, the need to kind of mold particular treatments, evidence-based treatments, such as cognitive behavioral therapy and other psychosocial interventions, in addition to understanding the overlapping traits with that. So today's talk, um, as Dr. Holt mentioned, is going to be not necessarily focused on first episode, but kind of uh, wherever kind of an individual is in their stage of recovery is understanding what are different types of treatments, psychosocial treatments that could be helpful. Um, and it's not diagnostic specific. We really think of this as kind of symptom specific or profiles of strengths and weaknesses and how we can support uh, an individual's particular vulnerability and, and, and meet their goals. So no disclosures here. So the primary goals of the talk will really kind of lead today with a basic working knowledge of autism spectrum disorders. Um, and we'll go a little bit into schizophrenia, but I know you all are well informed and really going along and, and, and discussing the overlapping traits among these conditions. And then understand that there's a high level of variability in the presentation of symptoms in both of these conditions. And I think, I think we'd all kind of agree at this point in the field that uh, not only with autism and schizophrenia, but across kind of psychiatric conditions, that all of these things fall on a, a spectrum. And that spectrum is not necessarily unidimensional, low functioning, high functioning. It's a, a spectrum across many different areas of someone's abilities. And so, you know, the, 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 the title of that talk really, or this talk really could be Autism Spectrum Disorders or Schizophrenias, right? Or Schizophrenia Spectrum Disorders. And indeed, that's kind of what the new DSM-5 kind of indicates is that schizophren schizophrenia spectrum and, and related conditions. And then really become more knowledgeable of the key components of psychosocial treatment for these conditions. So we're really going to focus a lot on psychosocial treatment. Um, I won't focus too much on uh, psychopharmacology. That's not my expertise. I'm a clinical psychologist. But this is kind of thinking this in addition to what you would be doing with your psychiatrist or psychopharmacologist. What are some of the psychosocial treatment components that can be helpful? So there's been a long-standing history of clinical and research interests in terms of the connection or inter, uh, the, the interlink between autism spectrum disorders and schizophrenia. So autism, 
was first coined in the early 20th century to describe a key feature of schizophrenia. So it was first used in kind of the schizophrenia field. It's, it's autism is, uh, the origin is, uh, the origin of the word is Greek. It, it's from autos, which means self, and it was really to describe a disengagement from the world. In 1943, a child psychiatrist then utilized that term to describe autism spectrum disorder features in children and adolescents with autism, kind of as we know the features of autism today. And then in the 70s, um, a psychiatrist, Israel Colvin, noticed that psychosis did not onset for children with autism features that occurred uh, before age three. And this really led to the first time in, in our diagnostic uh, manual that we use to really uh, appropriately kind of separate these two disorders into distinct conditions based on clinical, familial, and, and follow-up studies. So we're going to talk, uh, we're going to go through the diagnostic criteria for an autism spectrum disorder. And really, there's kind of three pillars that we look for in an autism spectrum disorder. One is communication. That can be difficulties, delays in spoken language, or failure to compensate through gesturing. Um, it can also include stereotyped or idiosyncratic speech, or maybe atypical speech patterns. At the heart of autism spectrum disorders are really uh, uh, di difficulties or vulnerabilities in someone's social functioning. So uh, this includes uh, social nonverbal behaviors, as, as Dr. Holt has kind of touched on uh, at the beginning of, of today. Maybe lack of shared enjoyment in social functioning or social interchange or lack of social emotional reciprocity. So your social functioning is really an intricate dance of both verbal abilities nonverbal abilities, effective interchanges, and, and which includes kind of nonverbal cues, right? So as I'm talking right now, you're listening to the words I'm saying, you're seeing that I'm using gestures, right? And you're looking at my effective expressions, and your brain in a very intricate manner simultaneously processes all of that information. Um, and it's, but it's not an easy skill set, really. It's a very uh, orchestrated and, and intricate skill set and kind of dance that we do in terms of uh, uh, socializing. And so in individuals impacted or affected by autism spectrum disorders, we see that some breakdowns in that kind of intricate dance, right? The third area of autism spectrum disorders is called restrictive repetitive behaviors interests or language. So this is kind of a, a hodgepodge of symptomatologies or symptoms that would include kind of strong interests in things, um, very strong interest that gets in the way of functioning. Uh, it could include compulsive adherence to non-functional routines or ritual, ritualized behaviors, or hyper or hypo reactivity to or unusual interests in sensory stimuli. There's often common associated features with autism spectrum disorders as well, such as executive functioning, gross and fine motor difficulties in early development and later stages in development, um, as well as comorbid emotional vulnerabilities, which we'll talk about a little bit further as we get to the talk here. What did you say about executive functioning? About executive functioning? Yep. So autism spectrum disorders oftentimes, not always, comes with executive functioning vulnerabilities. Executive functioning is really your ability to be the CEO of yourself, right? To manage um, your day-to-day -day organization, right? Time management, making sure you have all your materials before you head off to work, getting up on time so you can make an appointment. And at times, not all the time, and this is um, why we kind of consider these things kind of a spectrum, is that at times that individuals impacted or affected by autism spectrum disorders can experience challenges with executive functioning. A byproduct of having these difficulties. So I think uh, it depends. I think um, it depends in terms of the etiology or the causes of anxiety and depression is probably multifactorial. It could be the social abilities. It could be executive functioning. It could be both. Um, but it's something that um, that that is that is highly common, I guess, in autism spectrum disorders. Not always, though. Do does an individual who's impacted by autism experience these challenges? So when we make a diagnosis of autism, we usually make a diagnosis with or without intellectual, uh, intellectual impairment or language impairment. 
Um, we usually indicate whether it's associated with a known medical or genetic or another uh, 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 neurodevelopmental disorder, whether it's associated with catatonia or not. And then we kind of have a uh, rating scale just in terms of where are the, where are, in terms of describing the um, uh, strengths and weaknesses of that individual. So ranging from level one to three, one requiring support, three requiring very substantial support in those kind of key areas that we had talked about um, uh, in autism spectrum disorders. So in terms of the state of the field, where do we currently stand with autism? Well, the CDC currently estimates that about one in 68 children are diagnosed in the US with an autism spectrum disorder. It's approximately five times more common in males than females, and it can be identified as early as 18 months, but most reliably diagnosed uh, by two years of age. Um, I don't like the word causes that I put up there because you know the specific pathways really remain somewhat elusive. These are, we should consider these as kind of risk factors, right? So the literature kind of tells us that uh, multiple research camps have supported that genes play an integral role um, in the onset or, or increasing risk for autism spectrum disorders where heritability estimates are anywhere between 37 to 90 percent. Additionally, there's been some sibling studies, and given that genes play a role, siblings are at risk. Siblings of individuals who have an autism diagnosis are at risk for developing the condition, and that higher risk ranges from about 2 to 18 percent. And this, this uh, I guess on a general level, provides further support in terms of uh, genes playing an integral role in the onset of autism. There are other risk factors as well, including genetic conditions, uh, certain prescription drug intake during pregnancy, age of parents, low birth weight, and several neural and brain anatomical abnormalities. So why is it so complex to identify the genes then in autism? We know that it, if genes play an integral role, we have a lot of data supporting that. And, and this, these same principles, I think, can be applied to schizophrenia as well. Well, the reason being is that there's a, what we call like a polygenic nature to the, to the risk factors of autism spectrum disorders. And what that, what that boils down to is that a family can have two children, both, let's say, are diagnosed with an autism spectrum disorder. If we were to identify the genes that impacted, let's say, sibling A, that, that, that were the risk factors for an autism spectrum disorder, those genes that that particular child inherited would not necessarily be the same genes that sibling B, who's also affected with autism, inherited. And so what that indicates is that we're not passing, the, the genes that are the risk factors are not necessarily passed to each child. There are different combinations of genes that can result in that diagnosis. And that kind of principle is, is what overlaps many of these conditions, including autism spectrum disorders and schizophrenia. So I won't go too much into the de detail into the criteria for schizophrenia, um, but this is just for the sake of kind of lining up the different symptomatologies and how we diagnose formally from the DSM-5, right? So schizophrenia, uh, some of the symptoms include delusions, hallucinations, as well as functional impairment that falls below expectations in our baseline. We typically rule out effective psychoses due to depression or bipolar disorder. And then if there is a history of ASD, an additional diagnosis of schizophrenia is made only if prominent delusions or hallucinations are present for one month. So in terms of the state of the field where we are in schizophrenia, about 1% of the US population is, is impacted and more than 21 million people worldwide based on the World Health Organization, um, some data from the World Health Organization. It onsets early to mid 20s for males and in the late 20s for females. There is a childhood onset of psychosis. It does exist in lower base rates, however. And the risk factors, there's, there's a myriad of causes likely, right? And yet those specific pathways still remain somewhat elusive. I think as Dr. Holt and Dr. Kaneko have already addressed, uh, just talking about heritability estimates uh, with schizophrenia as well as concordance rates in twins is around uh, 40 to 50%. This gets into a, a few more risk factors that I think Dr. Hold already had touched on, so I'll go quickly through this, but um, pregnancy with birth complications as well as several neural and brain anatomical abnormalities that have been associated with the onset of this condition and psychosocial factors and environments such as stress, infections, malnutrition, 
um, uh, and so forth. So aren't these disorders clearly different? I've just went through the diagnostic criteria. Um, ASD is aberrant development in communication, social functioning, along with restricted and repetitive inner stereotype behaviors. And schizophrenia is a duration, a constellation of delusions, hallucinations, disorganized speech, and or behaviors, right? Well, I'm gonna give you, uh, my answer to this is one that I know you love from your clinicians and providers. It's yes and no, right? Or it depends, right? And it, in terms of the no, we can see that diagnostically, right? From the DSM, we can see that the symptomatology in terms of how we diagnose is different, but there are a lot of shared traits and commonalities between these conditions. And I want to be uh, just clear that I'm not saying that everyone with autism has symptoms of schizophrenia or everyone with schizophrenia has symptoms of autism. My point is that there are shared traits or characteristics that kind of overlap between the conditions, right? So one of the things that they share is uh, from, from the autism world perspective is uh, in the 1980s, a psychiatrist, Lorna Wing, coined this term, the spectrum, and really wanted to get researchers, clinicians, families, and patients alike to really understand this condition as a spectrum condition. And I think this same principle is kind of how we kind of understand uh, schizophrenia to date, right? And so think of this, uh, the spectrum, the way that she kind of conceptualized it was as kind of light going through a prism, right? And so if you think of the initial causal processes, which remain somewhat elusive to this point, although we do have some data on that, that impact an individual and onset the disorder, right? Then those things are kind of refracted in a broad spectrum in terms of how they impact a particular individual's functioning, right? And so that's where kind of the spectrum comes from. And think of each of these arrays, if you will, as a profile of an individual's symptoms, strengths and weaknesses, which we all have. And this is kind of how we want to understand um, autism spectrum disorders, as well as other neuropsychiatric conditions on more of a dimensional level, right? Not necessarily categorical. There's an adage in the field of autism that oftentimes is utilized is that if you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. And I think that's, that's similarly true with, with many um, conditions that, that we work with. So it's also become widely accepted that the course of schizophrenia often involves pre-morbid developmental disruptions, right? Including social vulnerabilities, Sometimes in early development, we can see difficulties with fine motor or gross motor control, sensory processing challenges, some of those smattering of symptoms that we see in autism spectrum disorders, strong interests or preoccupations and routine. Um, and there was a study that came out in 2013, which really identified the shared genetic risk factors across the five major, psychi across five major psychiatric diagnoses. Um, schizophrenia being one of those as well as autism. And so this really shed a lot of light for the field in terms of why are we seeing these phenotypic traits that kind of overlap between the conditions. And indeed, if we look at kind of the research, more recent research here, or I guess the re current research, uh, it's supported that 28 to 55% of patients with schizophrenia have symptoms associated with ASD meeting full criteria years before the onset of psychosis. And then in an ongoing NIMH study of childhood onset of schizophrenia, around 29% of the sample of 97 children were reported to have symptoms meeting criteria for ASD. And 100% of them, per their report, right, um, have one or more social impairments. Again, this is a study. It doesn't mean that everyone with schizophrenia or is impacted by schizophrenia has symptoms associated with an autism spectrum disorder. However, we, know, we can see that there, there are oftentimes commonalities, but not always. The prevalence of schizophrenia in average IQ adults with ASD is also 6%, which again kind of sheds more light on kind of the overlapping nature of these conditions. So, there is the DSM-5 criteria that lists 
kind of delineates the symptoms step by step for an autism spectrum disorder diagnosis, as well as for schizophrenia, right? But, and then there, uh, as clinicians, we try to disentangle um, what's going on from a diagnostic standpoint, because that helps inform treatment, right? And really kind of what we're seeing is, this is kind of what we're seeing uh, clinically, is that the more accurate picture is that there's a lot of overlap between autism spectrum disorders and schizophrenia. And the even more accurate picture is something like this, right? So it's a really complex thing that, that we are doing as clinicians, you all are doing as um, advocates for your, for your loved ones and family, is disentangling, one, what is going on? Why are there so many challenges or vulnerabilities in addition to your loved one's strengths? And then kind of what the heck do we do in terms of treatment, right? And this really highlights the complexity of just broadly what we're doing from a psychiatry standpoint, particularly from a diagnostic standpoint and treatment planning standpoint, right? So, oh, thank you. <laughs> so here's another way to look at it. So I know it's late in the afternoon, but y'all just had lunch and this looks a lot to digest, but bear with me, there's no, there's no quiz and uh, I asked colleagues about this, it was mixed reviews. My wife said, no, don't include it. My five-year-old said, it's confusing, but you should keep it. So <laughs> here, here we are. <laughs> so, um, so this is another way to look at this all. Let's pretend that you, we're all clinicians in the room, right? You have a referral, someone comes into the clinic, and we are just, let's say just autism is on the table, right? Does this child, adult, um, are they presenting with symptoms associated with an autism spectrum disorder? Um, so one way to think about this is uh, in a kind of X and Y axis, right? Where let's say uh, this is the number and level or sever number and severity level of autism related symptoms, zero to 100, right? Um, so this is zero, this is severe symptoms and uh, a high frequency of symptoms of autism spectrum disorders. And this is percentage of the population from zero to 100, okay? So think of this as, and then we have this normal curve here, okay, which is just kind of a bell curve. And each and every one of us in this room and in the world, I should say, falls somewhere here, right? No one really is without symptoms of an autism spectrum disorder. We all kind of have our uh, kind of quirks, uh, could be difficulties with organization, could be sensory sens sensitivities. Some of us don't like social functioning, right, or social settings as much as others. Uh, we all fall somewhere here. And our job as diagnosticians, right, is really to, um, we, we make a determination of when symptoms reach a diagnostic threshold. And typically what that means is that not just you have symptoms, but that the symptoms are getting in the way of somebody's day-to-day -day functioning, right? So there's what we call functional impairment. And so we, uh, uh, what we do is as you go further down this number and severity level of autism-related symptoms, you can see that a large percentage of the population has some kind of level of symptoms of autism spectrum disorders, right? Uh, and then as we further get down this x-axis into the mild to moderate range here, at some point these symptoms start to impair somebody's functioning. They get in the way of goal attainment, right? Or they cause stress. And so our jobs is to kind of make that term determination of is a diagnosis <coughs> indicated or is it going to be, uh, is it something that should be indicated? And then we can see the autism population here, right, is this kind of other curve. So this is a difficult job. This is, oh, I'm sorry. This is a difficult job. It's not an easy, easy job whatsoever, right? But um, when we're just determining autism, let's say from no autism diagnosis. But then the next, ask, the next thing that we're oftentimes asked to do is then say, well, is it autism or is it another co-occurring condition, right? And this is where other clinical populations, such as schizophrenia, sometimes fall. Not all the time, but sometimes. Right. Does that relatively make sense? Too much to digest or? Okay. All right. All right. So getting back to kind of this more accurate picture or more accurate story of the overlap between these conditions, 
Um, one of the primary, or three of kind of the primary things that we see in terms of overlap are uh, social, emotional, and cognitive processes across these two disorders, right? And Dr. Holt had discussed some of those already, and uh, we're going to get into a, a few more of those um, here today. So in terms of shared social, emotional, or cognitive vulnerabilities, one is verbal social communication, all right? So this can mean language development or, let's say, idiosyncratic language. This can sometimes be observed in schizophrenia, uh, pr let's say, pre-morbidly or in early development, difficulties with language development or idiosyncratic use of language. Um, it can also be observed in later stages difficulties with kind of what we call the pragmatic use of language. It is essentially kind of like small talk, how you use language to navigate uh, your, your functioning in the real world, right? Uh, social withdrawal is another kind of overlapping characteristic among these two conditions. There, and Dr. Holt's expertise here is with really in kind of the nonverbal social communication in schizophrenia, and what we also see in autism spectrum disorders are similar difficulties in this particular area. So she has a, an, a very, very interesting project looking at, uh, it's called the Looming Project, and Jessica Mao is somewhere in the back. There she is back there, so please um, talk with her about it if you're interested in doing this, where we're looking at individuals affected uh, by uh, uh, psychotic spectrum conditions and looking at their comfort, and as well as siblings and relatives of those individuals uh, and healthy controls uh, in looking at individuals' uh, comfortability with personal space or proximity in terms of how comfortable they are in social situations. And that is really important because we, it gives us better clues and insight into some of the most difficult things to treat in both autism as well as schizophrenia, and that being kind of negative symptoms, social withdrawal, and so forth. Other aspects of nonverbal social communication include emotion recognition in faces, eye contact, effective expression, or gesturing for means of communication. Those are all areas that are impacted in both autism spectrum disorders as well as schizophrenia. Another piece is the cognition piece, right? So executive or other neurocognitive weaknesses such as working memory, processing speed, and goal initiation. So as clinicians, we throw around these terms a lot, but they're not that intuitive. So working memory is essentially your brain's ability to hold on to information in the short term, right? So think of this as if you're writing uh, someone's name in the sand, right? It's how quickly kind of the shore comes up and washes that away. Good working memory is that name stays there for a very long time. Eventually, the shore comes up and washes that away, but, um, but it stays there for longer than if uh, the poor or kind of challenges with working memory would mean that the shore comes up and washes those words away very, very quickly. And that can impact someone's kind of functioning organization or ability to kind of process information. Another piece is perspective taking, which there's a lot of kind of overlap between social and social cognition, which there's been a lot of talk on today. So I'm going to show you a task here of one of the measures. This was developed in the UK by Kim Murray, uh, and uh, it is a measure of theory of mind, which is another skill set that's impacted in both of these conditions. And for this, I want you to watch this very short clip. And um, in this clip, there's going to be two characters, uh, a man called Max and a woman called Alice. And Max and Alice are partners. They live and work together. And I'm going to ask you some questions just in terms of uh, it to assess kind of your theory of mind or mentalizing abilities. And that's your ability, again, to kind of uh, represent the mental states of yourself and represent the mental states of others. This is Alice. Hi, uh, Max. 
I'm sorry, I had so much work to do. I'm literally leaving work now. All right, sorry if that hit too close to home for anyone, but <laughs> why did Alice say that? She's embarrassed. She's embarrassed, right? Any other, any other ideas or thoughts? It wasn't true. She's lying, right? All right. If you were in Max's situation, what would you say next? Sorry for interrupting. Okay. What's that noise in the background? So, yes, you would start to question Alice a little bit, right? I hear dishes clanging. It sounds like you're in a bar. It doesn't sound like you're leaving work, right? So, great. Excellent. So, those are just the types of tasks that we utilize to measure things like theory of mind or mentalizing. Um, and to measure those particular skill sets that are impacted in both of these conditions, right? All right, just in terms of the emotional overlap or emotional functioning, we can see that there's a high level of comorbidity in each of these conditions. And we also know that the social, emotional, and cognitive impairments in both of these conditions, uh, they are associated with occupational and school challenges, difficulties with friendship cultivation, and overall reduced quality of life. So what do we do, right? And this applies to both these psychosocial treatments in addition to the psychopharmacology, if indicated, um, are, are some aspects of, of what we do for both of these conditions. First episode, later stage in, in illness, and so forth. And it sometimes takes a village, right? This isn't always the case. So we're going to be going through kind of treatments and talking about critical domains. Um, it doesn't mean that all the critical domains apply to everyone. It just means the, these are the things that we try to overturn as we're kind of developing treatment goals, uh, the evaluation process in our team meetings and so forth. We really don't want any rock to go un, uh, unturned, right? One of the primary things that we do is we want to take a three-pronged approach with regards to treatment. So it has to be, we want to do things that are evidence-based. What does the science say about this treatment? That's individualized. There's not one treatment recipe, and that it's intense in terms of duration, frequency, and comprehensiveness. And each of those factors are individualized in, uh, for the patient and for the family. Access to specialized providers is something that we do a lot of. Uh, comprehensive access to specialized providers, if indicated, can be incredibly, incredibly helpful, which includes psychiatry, psychology, social work, speech and language. Uh, Dr. Kinigo had talked about our supported employment and educational specialists, and now we are very fortunate enough to have peer specialists as part in, in, infused in some of our programming as well. And these are just some cr critical domains. Again, this isn't something, uh, these aren't all the areas that are indicated in all individuals, but these are things that we really assess and look into. And those include things like reduction of maladaptive symptoms, including emotional and behavioral vulnerabilities, education and employment, motor development, goal attainment, substance use, quality of life, healthy lifestyle. And, and really, uh, a part of what we do is just feeling a sense of community and belonging. That can be very powerful, I think, in, in our treatment approach. And we try to do that uh, as best we can. And I'll get into how we try to do that a little bit later. In terms of what are particular aspects of our treatment, and Dr. Kinigo had our, has already touched on some of this, but I'll go into a little bit more detail. One of the primary approaches that we take with both of these conditions is uh, psychoeducation about the condition and psychoeducation about optimal management, both for patient and family. We really utilize a strengths approach and promote, I think, kind of neurodiversity, right? We all are, each and every one of us, our brains work differently, and different doesn't mean bad, different just sometimes means different, right? Um, and we really promote that idea of that neurodiversity is an okay thing, and that we want to optimize your strengths and support vulnerabilities to achieve goals. That leads to really hoping to destigmatize the condition that they present obstacles but don't dictate quality of life necessarily, right? And some of the language that we use is that when you break your arm, you're not a broken arm, you're managing or treating a broken arm. And we oftentimes think of that as that relates to autism spectrum disorders as well as, as schizophrenia. Normalization, and, and, and I think one of the most important things is that we don't put a ceiling on individuals, right? 
because uh, humans will inevitably prove you wrong. And I think that's one thing that, that we kind of preach a lot to our patients and families uh, in terms of goal attainment, whatever that may be. Cognitive and, or behavioral and cognitive behavioral therapy is, is a big part that I think is, is really kind of the meat and potatoes probably of our, sorry, I'm from the Midwest, so I use some of those meat and potatoes terminology, but is, is some of uh, the meat and potatoes of some of our treatments, right? So anything from behavioral activation, getting involved in music lessons, going to the gym, uh, getting connected to your community, strategies rooted in applied behavioral analysis, right? And I know that is oftentimes associated with autism spectrum disorders. However, it's something that's very useful across conditions. Essentially, the root of applied behavioral analysis, or ABA, ABA is taking small steps. I'll stop hitting the mic here soon. Taking small steps to achieve overall behaviors or goals, right? Cognitive restructuring is a big piece of cognitive behavioral therapy, obviously, uh, to help address co-occurring emotional challenges. The premise of that is that what, we, what I typically utilize is, is thoughts are not facts, right? I had a thought this morning that I would come up here and pass out. It hasn't happened yet, but you know that's the thought that we try to restructure and work through. What's the evidence for that? What's the evidence against that, right? Mindfulness training, which Dr. Holt has already kind of touched on, and uh, um, ERP, or exposure response prevention, is something we utilize quite a bit too. And essentially what that is, is facing stimuli or engaging or not engaging in behavior that may create distress, but developing coping strategies so that, um, one, you're not reinforcing behaviors, and that could be like uh, even rumination, or it could be other aspects of kind of compulsive behaviors that are getting in the way of somebody's functioning. Social skills and adaptive life skills training uh, is something that's important across both of these conditions. Everything from friendship and social network cultivation, um, navigating dating and sex education, money management, independent living, family involvement and psychoeducation, which I know Dr. Kaneko has touched on or, or had discussed at length um, in his talk. I think shared decision making is also an important aspect within both of these conditions, right? You're all working it collaboratively as a team to make decisions in terms of goals uh, for treatment and so forth. Nutrition and exercise is something that we really kind of stress as well. We're getting some, Ala Shapiro is our social worker and we're getting some groups together to support healthy lifestyles and uh, supported employment and education. And I think with supported employment education, I, I'm biased as, as a neuropsychologist, but I do think neuropsychological testing can be crucial for this, right? Um, it can help, uh, it, what it does do is it, it, it kind of profiles a list of strengths and vulnerabilities so that we know what an individual's strengths are in terms of their cognitive abilities, executive functioning, and so forth. And we also know the vulnerabilities, and that gives us a blueprint of how we can best support. Uh, that individual in the workplace, at home, and at school. I have a little note there that says IQ is overrated, right? This is my bread and butter, but, but it really is. You know, if you do get neuropsychological testing, right, and let's say, don't focus on the scores. It, it really just gives a snapshot and a profile of strengths and weaknesses, but it does not measure things like grit, determination, and just basically being a human, right? You could have a 130 IQ and be non-functional, or you could have something substantially below that and be very happy functioning well in the workplace and school. Um, do not get caught up in IQ scores. The, the reason that we provide those scores is really to kind of give us an idea of what best would be helpful, right? So this is a presentation faux pas, and I apologize for that because there's a lot of words. I do not expect you to be able to read that, but I'll go through some of them. But I, what, I knew it was gonna be in your printout, so I wanted to put it in there so you have it as reference. Um, so some of the things in terms of psychosocial treatment, one of the most important aspects, uh, in my opinion, around treatment is really we can work with the individual, let's say in CBT, behavioral activation, and helping them cope with emotional vulnerabilities and so forth. In addition to that, though, we also need to support kind of environmental contexts, right? Uh, such as school, such as the workplace. How can we support an individual in those settings? And, and so in my eyes, it's so important 
to support someone in those particular settings, particularly a school setting or workplace setting, because it is something that's so important for an individual's quality of life and happiness. And so from a school standpoint, and think of this as elementary, middle, high school, there are particular, there are always services uh, that are available. Um, these are, can be provided through an IEP or 504. As someone pointed out earlier today to me, uh, just to highlight that typically these do require, these do require um, a, a neuropsych testing, all right, um, and, or testing through the school. And so some treatments are regular access to counselors, modified workloads, and so forth. These are treatment supports for college, accessing the Office of Disability. Um, in addition to being eligible for alternate schedule for prerequisites and receive priority with class registration each semester. And I'll skip through some of these because I know you have them. I'm running out of time here. In the workplace, one of the things that can be helpful are things like being assigned a point person on a job. This person may not be that person's direct supervisor. Using a calm voice as well as support of a nurturing approach. Breaks when switching between tasks. Uh, these are some other ones for the workplace, access to uh, a handwritten copy of expectations or rules on the job, access to completed work examples. And then here are just a list of some helpful resources that we, we guide families in accessing in the community, including DMH, uh, DDS, I believe NAMI is in the room tonight and may, may be speaking here in a little bit. Um, but those are really key kind of components in terms of helping our, our patients and families. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, I think uh, just in the interest of time, we'll just have just a couple of questions. People have some really great questions here.